Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's discussion is about the vitally important issue of mental health. Recent studies tell us that every year, nearly 20% of American adults, that's more than 60 million people, meet the criteria for having a mental illness, and 50% of Americans will suffer from a mental illness at some point in their lives. And yet 60% of Americans with a mental illness receive no treatment, often because of the stigma that still attaches to mental illness. Our guest has written a fascinating and insightful book entitled Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. The book explores the combined impact of culture and history on our shifting perceptions of mental illness, which too often involve fear, prejudice, shame, and the desire to brand and exclude people who are seen as weak, flawed, incompetent, or at fault for their condition. He's a professor of anthropology at George Washington University and editor-in-chief of Anthropological Quarterly. He's written seven books, including the groundbreaking Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Roy Richard Grinker to our show. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks, Harvey. I'm really pleased to be with you. Richard, mental illness is fast becoming a more accepted and visible part of the human condition. We've seen celebrities like Patty Duke, Lady Gaga, David Letterman, and Bruce Springsteen talk openly about their emotional struggles. And we were all shocked by the suicides of Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade. And yet, mental illness in our society still attracts a great deal of stigma which dissuades many people from seeking help, doesn't it? It does, but I have to say that the fact that we know so much more about people who are suffering from mental illnesses because suicides are not kept as secret as they used to be, means that we might be on a course for reducing the stigma that makes people keep silent when they're suffering, whether it's their own suffering or the suffering of their families, because none of us, of course, is immune to mental illness, but also none of us is isolated from others who suffer from mental illnesses. Because if it's not you, it's your partner or it's your parent or it's your child or a friend. Now, there are other illnesses that have been stigmatizing like cancer, AIDS, sexually transmitted diseases, but you say that the stigma attaching to mental illness is different. Why is that? It's different because the stigma attached to mental illness has tended to, as you said in your introduction, blamed the individual. You know, we have developed our notions of, of what a good person is in Europe and North America out of a history of capitalism in which we idealize the independent, responsible, autonomous person, you know, dependent on nobody, accountable only to themselves. And so when somebody can't fulfill that ideal, whether it's the capitalist ideal of autonomy or the capitalist ideal of being a productive worker, we blame them. Whereas we tend less often to blame somebody for their affliction with a virus or a bacterium or a cancer. I want to mention that you choose to use the term mental illness rather than mental disorder. Can you explain why? Sure. You know, I think that one of the things that that has come about in our in the social sciences has been a distinction between disease and illness, where we use the term disease to refer to, you know, what the technician sees, the tumor, the virus, the bacterium. But illness refers to the entire experience of suffering. So I give the example of somebody who's diagnosed with breast cancer. And the technician can look at it under a microscope and see the disease. But that's only the beginning, right? The person's life changes. They have emotional changes. Their relationships with other people change. Their vision of the future changes. Maybe if they live in a society that seeks religious healing, they'll seek a religious leader to help them. And if they live in a society that that uses herbal remedies, they'll use that. And you can't see any of that stuff under a microscope. 
right? The illness is the, the whole experience of the person. And one of the things that I think has been problematic in the history of stigmatizing mental illness is that we see the person as having a disease of the mind rather than of having a condition that has many, many factors, including what their society is, what their social supports are, what the moral judgments are. There's nothing in a microscope that can explain to you why we for so long discriminated against people with disabilities or uh, people who loved someone of the same sex. Richard, your book is jam-packed with really eye-opening information. For example, anorexia is the most fatal mental illness with a 10% mortality rate. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among American teenagers, and 9% of American children have ADHD. Mental illness accounts for at least 12% of total diseases worldwide. You wrote that given these numbers, the concept of being, quote, normal is a damaging illusion. What did you mean by that? Well, normal at one point in time was just a mathematical term that meant average. But in the mid 20th century, in what David Reisman, the sociologist called the age of conformity, where everybody wanted to be like everybody else, normal became this sort of imagined thing to aspire to. And if you didn't, you were discriminated against or your family was shamed. So take, for example, the you know, mid 20th century, the great child psychologist, Eric Erickson, father of child psychology, Pul Pulitzer Prize winner, Harvard University professor. He and his wife have a child born with Down syndrome. They send the child to a residential institution directly from the hospital, come home and tell all their friends and family, including their children, that the baby died at birth, completely eliminating this young boy, this baby from his world. That doesn't happen in a world in which we value diversity and inclusion. That happens in a world in which there is this constrained and confined idea of what is quote unquote normal. Your book discusses three main historical sources for the stigma that has attached to mental illness. The first is capitalism, which marginalized and isolated anyone who was unable to work because they were seen as economically unproductive and inferior human beings. You even discovered that there were pro-slavery advocates who argued that slavery was necessary to prevent mental illness in African-Americans. That's just shocking. I know it's, it was really amazing to discover this medical term, drapetomania. And the symptom of drapetomania in the mid 19th century was for when a slave wanted to be free. I mean, that was considered to be a mental illness. Now you could, you could also find examples in the 20th century where during, under Stalin, under Khrushchev, political prisoners, people who were against the current state were labeled as schizophrenic because they were clearly delusional if they thought that you did, you shouldn't have a communist socialist state. So the, our, our history is really complete with all these examples of defining somebody who's different as somehow actually having a different mind, a different sort of, of, of brain. The second historical factor you identify in the book is war. You say that the stigma of mental illness tends to lessen during wars because there's great public empathy for PTSD, which is seen as almost a badge of honor for soldiers returning from wars. But then the stigma returns during peacetime. Why is that? Yeah, it's a kind of interesting process in which if you have a sort of global stressor, everybody thinks, you know, it's reasonable, it's expectable that you will suffer, that you will have depression, anxiety, whatever it might be. But then after wars, there has long been an assumption in clinical circles in particular, and but also in popular discourse, that once the stress is over, once that war is over, 
well, you shouldn't suffer anymore. And so we've really struggled, those of us who work in mental health, to try and make sure that people understand the very long-term consequences of trauma. Now, COVID obviously is in a, some sense a global, it is in many senses, it's a global sense uh, stressor, and many political leaders have likened COVID to a war. And if you say, oh, in COVID, during the pandemic, I was anxious, I was depressed, I was lonely, uh, I don't think anybody's going to tell you that you were fragile and weak. They're probably going to say, yes, me too, to some degree or another, right? And so that's how these stressors become normalizing. As my grandfather, who is a director of psychiatric operations for the army during World War II put it, these aren't abnormal people who are suffering. These are normal people in abnormal circumstances. But he also stressed that the effects of that trauma could extend well into that person's life and even to pass on to the next generation. I was surprised to learn, Richard, that many of the most important medical advances, including psychiatric achievements, came from military medicine developed during wartime. And yet most military histories don't even mention psychiatry. And most histories of psychiatry don't even mention the military. Do you know why that is? Yeah, I think that there is a lot of discomfort uh, among uh, historians, but also perhaps among other kinds of chroniclers of, of, uh, of history to, to see wars as productive almost as if you're saying that war was good, you know? And we, ha we have to figure out a way to talk about that because I mean, I, I'm very anti-war, of course. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that any war is good, but wars aren't just aberrations. They are moments of time that change things. They build upon pre-existing structures and they involve often uh, bursts of energy in certain areas. So we would not have the anesthesia that we use in surgery if it weren't for military medicine, right? We wouldn't have psychiatry as we know it without military medicine. And in fact, it was psychiatry during World War II that brought mental illness out of the asylums to say, wait a minute, it's not just people who we, we throw away in mental institutions, in these residential institutions, insane asylums and so on. Mental illnesses afflict a much, much wider public. And it was not then long after World War II that uh, Harry Truman founds the National Institute of Mental Health, orders that the military manual of mental disorders be adapted to become a civilian document, which became the first DSM-1, the uh, DSM, the sort of Bible of, of American psychiatry. And then we see two epidemiologic studies, one in Sterling County, Ontario, the other one in New York, in Manhattan, showing that mental illnesses are much, much more common in the general population than anyone had ever expected. Now, going back to PTSD, do you think the word disorder, which is the D in PTSD, should be dropped because of the stigma that can flow from that word? I don't have a personal opinion on the diagnostic term itself, PTSD, but I prefer illness to disorder just because I, you know, I think that there is a, a reason to question what that term evokes. Disorder evokes lots of the euphemisms and the negative words that we've, we've used to hurt people. Disorder, like a screw loose, you know, lost it, broken apart, cracked apart, breakdown. And those are all sort of, you know, glosses on disorder. But I do think that it is important that we do diagnose mental illnesses, whether we call them disorders or not, because diagnoses drive treatments. So not everybody with a you know, certain amount of anxiety has to be diagnosed with a anxiety disorder unless they are impaired enough that they really need help. I have anxiety enough to make sure that I survive every day. I don't, I look both ways before I cross the street. I make sure about the traffic lights. And there's a lot of anxiety in that, that goes into that. We evolved this as human beings to survive. But if my anxiety got to the point where I couldn't go to work, well, then I need to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder because I need to get care. 
The third historical source of stigma you identified in the book is the increasing medicalization of mental illness. And by that, you're referring to our desire to reduce stigma by characterizing mental illnesses as something physical, like a biological brain disorder. But if I understand you correctly, when we label a mentally ill person as having a brain defect, we're actually stigmatizing them even more, correct? There is no evidence from any of the research that's been done that the movement to see mental illnesses as brain disorders has decreased stigma. Now, looking at the brain may end up giving us new revolutionary treatments. It's possible. When we understand a mental disorder or a mental illness better, it could potentially decrease stigma. But that's not where we are right now. Where we are right now is that all of the researchers in the world are trying to look at mental illnesses as brain disorders, and that ends up making people more frightened of the person, as if they don't have control over their selves, that their brain controls them, and they don't have the autonomy, the independence, and the responsibility that we have come to know as the ideal person in a capitalist society. And even when we have developed an amazing technique for saving lives, which is uh, the use of electroconvulsive therapy for treatment resistant depression and something that acts directly on the brain, that became, that's become one of the most feared of, of all therapies. And yet it's a lifesaver. So if it acts directly on the brain, you know, that conflicts with our notion that the brain is really the source of our morals and our ethics and our personality and our souls. One of the themes that permeates your book is the historical connection between the diagnosis and treatment of mental illness and sexism. The early psychiatrists were constantly labeling women as insane or hysterical without justification. And after World War II, mothers started being blamed for every mental health problem. I love blaming my mother for all my problems. But <laughs> why is there this historical desire to victimize women? My mother once gave me a, a needlepoint pillow that she made that said, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that the answer to your question is that uh, mental illness and stigma in general have been used as a form of discrimination of any kind of difference, which is why in the middle of the 20th century, people who were self-identifying as gay were thought to be suffering from a mental illness, that homosexuality was a mental illness. Women were suffering from mental illnesses because they were different than men, or they were, at least they were supposed to be different than men. In fact, lobotomies were used primarily to reinforce gender norms, to change a woman who was, or a girl who was willful, aggressive, ambitious, irritable, into a docile body. And so what we see is that psychiatry, the history of psychiatry, while it's done some wonderful things, has also served as a tool of discrimination. Look only at what we just talked about with slavery and drapetomania. You know, and, and, and the, the doctors thought they were, they were right. I mean, they weren't bad people necessarily, but in that historical context, they felt that it was absolutely valid to say that somebody who was gay was mentally ill. Somebody who was black was more likely to have this illness than that illness. Now your great grandfather, grandfather and father were all either psychiatrists or very, very involved in mental health. And, and, and your wife is a psychiatrist. Is that That's correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your, your grandfather underwent psychoanalysis with Dr. Sigmund Freud, which is pretty amazing. Now, psychoanalysis is different from psychiatry, and it's had a very tortured history in America, hasn't it? Yeah, um, it has, but it's responsible really for, I mean, we, we, can, we can set aside what one thinks of psychoanalysis today from this point, which is that it was the psychoanalytic movement that transformed psychiatry from being a science of managing 
uh, inmates in residential institutions to becoming a science of helping people suffering from emotional behavioral uh, problems in the general population. I think without psychoanalysis, we wouldn't have moved out of the asylums so easily. Because, you know, Freud said everybody's got a mental illness. Everybody's neurotic. In other words, nobody's normal. Right. It's just that as I, if I understood what you were writing in the book, psychoanalysis was not initially seen as science-based. It was only for the rich. Oh, that's absolutely true. That's another you know, form of discrimination about in which the mental health care that was given by the best doctors was psychoanalysis. And it's four times a week for you know, who knows how many dollars a day. For my grandfather in 1933, it was $20 a day. But that's equivalent to about $300 in uh, today's money. And he could only do his psychoanalysis because he got funding from the Rockefeller Foundation to have it as a form of training. So you would talk to mental health care professionals in the mid 20th century, and they would say, all the best doctors are psychoanalysts, and they all treat wealthy white people. And they didn't, I mean, they really, really did not have mental health care mid 20th century that was, uh, you would consider very competent for the rest of the world. Your grandfather was quoted as saying that the desire to be normal in American society was the essence of neurosis. What do you think he meant by that? I think he meant that everybody was struggling so hard to fit in and that there was a cost to that. There was an emotional cost to it. He did this study in Chicago too, where you know, most doctors who were doing research, they would look at a population and they'd find all the people who were healthy and separate them out and only look at the ones that were sick. And he decided to do the opposite. He said, let's just look at the people who don't meet the criteria for any mental illness at all. And he found that they were very boring people. <laughs> they didn't have much ambition. They weren't creative. They didn't have very rich social lives. And he asked this question in 1962, I think it was, is this the cost of normality? So I do see this book as kind of, you know, building on that legacy or, you know, taking, t- making it a legacy where my grandfather and I kind of share uh, similar views about difference and conformity. I think he would love your book. I think he would. He would have, he'd be 121 years old today if he was alive. Richard, I want to ask you about the impact of Hollywood movies. There was a 1996 movie called Primal Fear, starring Richard Gere and Edward Norton, about a young man charged with murder who successfully feigns mental illness so he can be found not guilty by reason of insanity. That movie created the impression that if a patient is a good actor, a psychiatrist won't be able to distinguish between the mentally ill and the healthy. Do you think that this could actually happen? Well, you could have one case here or there with a person feigning a mental illness or somebody who is a bad doctor or a set of bad doctors. But typically in in the legal system, uh, in uh, both uh, Canada and the United States, there are enough filters that people don't, uh, don't get by. For example, there was a famous study done called the Rosenhan study that turns out to have been fraudulently done and chronicled brilliantly in a book by uh, Susanna Cahalan called The Great Pretender, in which a psychologist, David Rosenhan, told people to pretend that they had schizophrenia and see if they would be admitted into hospitals. And he claimed that this was the case. In fact, he was several of the same patients. He just, he did it himself, uh, number pretending that he was others. Number two, judges were required to detain people and only if they were incapable of uh, being safe, not someone who just said, I I hear voices and then never said anything again. So uh, that's very hard to believe. But of course, you know, Hollywood is Hollywood and they're going to make things up. The other thing is a lot of people don't want to pretend to be mentally ill. We found we meaning historians of the military and military psychiatry, that very rarely did a person feign mental illness to get out of the military. 
there's a the TV show MASH had this famous character who was always wearing women's clothes to try to get out of the military. But that very rarely happened because you'd get a dishonorable discharge. You'd have a mental pathology on your record for the rest of your life. You would be incredibly stigmatized. You might not even be welcomed back to your hometown. So what do you think of movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest that really fueled a huge anti-psychiatry sentiment? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Columbia University Chair of Anthropology, Jeffrey Lieberman, is always talking about how there's no anti-cardiology movement. There's no anti, <laughs> you know, uh, oncology movement. And yet there is this very big anti-psychiatry movement. And I think it has, I think it's fueled by the, the legacy of the stigma of mental illness, that we fear mental illnesses. We see them as, as, as frightening, particularly if we don't have a good framework or a non, uh, you know, an understanding of what it is. The problem with One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is it showed electroconvulsive therapy being used as a punishment. And even at that time, when that book was written and that movie was made, people were given electroconvulsive therapy under anesthesia. And it was a lifesaver for many people who would otherwise have died. And I think that that movie did a great disservice to what is now called deep brain stimulation or neuromodulation is what it's called in which uh, certain kinds of electrical impulses are used. And so I spend on, I have an entire chapter on ECT because I think it's that important uh, to address and to dispel myths about it. Yeah, I think that one thing I really appreciated in your book that I, I, I've learned so much but the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest gave a totally wrong impression of electroconvulsive therapy, which is actually highly effective for treatment resistant depression. And you point out that defibrillators and pacemakers also involve electric shocks, but they don't generate stigma. Yeah, great point. Right. They're the heroes of the emergency room, right? The electricity to the, to the heart. But once you put electricity to the brain, that's a totally different thing, right? in our, in our, you know, symbolically, it's a totally different thing. I write about Kitty Dukakis and Dick Cavett and other celebrities who went through ECT. Now they, nobody's saying that electroconvulsive therapy is pleasant. I mean, getting chemotherapy is not pleasant. You, but you do it if you're at risk of dying. And so, yes, there are many negative aspects with many medical treatments, but we have to take a, you know, a kind of sober and, and long-term uh, look at it. And, you know, I, I know it, it could be a very contra, I knew that it could be a controversial part of my book, but I think it's important to write about rather than keep it secret. And while we're on the topic of Hollywood movies, I want to mention Rain Man starring Dustin Hoffman, which dealt with autism. Now, you know a lot about autism, and you've written very poignantly about your beautiful daughter, Isabel. Do movies like Rain Man bother you because they reinforce the stereotype that every autistic person is mathematically gifted? Well, you know, this is a problem with all of these frameworks that we have for looking at neurological or neurodiversity personality differences. There's always going to be one character that is in Hollywood, and then you think that's the stereotype. It's difficult. Um, on the one hand, I found that various movies about autism do create stereotypes, but they've tended to create stereotypes of higher functioning individuals, people who might be Silicon Valley executives, or there's the ABC television show, The Good Doctor, right? About a doctor who has autism and he's getting married and, and so on. But most people who have a diagnosis of autism have a diagnosis of autism because they need care. And they are more like my daughter or perhaps more like Dust, the Dustin Hoffman character as well, that they have sort of islands of great skill and capacity, but tremendous challenges with language. So you know, I don't think it was an inaccurate depiction of a person with autism, but as many advocates for um, autism say, you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. There's a lot of, of difference, 
where that concept of autism becomes so helpful is today where we've broadened the spectrum to include people like the good doctor and people who need more you know, intervention and care. We've done that so much that autism has become a non-stigmatized framework. And when my daughter graduated from high school and gave a graduation speech and people were giggling and murmuring when she started, once she said, a person with autism like me, the room quieted down because now she wasn't weird. She wasn't enigmatic or bizarre. She was a person with autism, which these kids had learned about and they learned about it as a less stigmatizing framework. It's not only fascinating as an example to see stigma appear and disappear within a matter of minutes, but it's also an example of how the generations have changed, that these kids' parents thought of autism differently than they do now. Yeah, that is so wonderful. Now, Richard, as you may know, I'm a criminal court judge, and I would say anecdotally that at least 70% of the accused persons we see in the criminal courts have severe, often undiagnosed mental health problems. So I was not at all surprised by your comment in the book that in the last 40 years, jails have replaced psychiatric hospitals as the largest providers of mental health care. Why has that been allowed to happen? I think there's so many factors, but one of them is that when John F. Kennedy signed the uh, Community Mental Health Act in 19, uh, I guess, It was just a month, I think, before he was assassinated. So it would have been 1963. The expectation was that there would be community mental health, that you would have lots and lots of funding for providing mental health care outside of residential institutions. And so thousands and thousands of people were released, sent home from residential institutions, but so many of them became homeless and they just sort of landed on the streets in poverty and have been shuttled around from one place to another constant. When you look at people with severe uh, mental illnesses in urban areas, they're constantly moving from one place to another. And the goal of every institution that does take care of them is to get rid of them and get them to a different institution. And um, we just didn't build up. We didn't have the funding to build up that kind of infrastructure. And so the jails have become the places where such people get care, and most of them for very petty crimes, often related to stealing a loaf of bread or or perhaps being disorderly or something like that, but not because they're scary, you know, frightening, violent, murderous people. The people that are being given the most of the mental health care in prisons are are not, not people who are dangerous. No, I, I was, your book, turned on a light bulb in my head when you explained that the asylums were closed when antipsychotic drugs were invented. And so many mentally ill people are now homeless and they end up in jail. Yeah. And, uh, and it's very hard when they don't have a, a sort of, you know, single home or place to, to reside and they're, and maybe their families don't want them. And, uh, I mean, it's a very, very sad situation. And, you know, and it's not cost effective because the cost of incarcerating, prosecuting people who really need treatment because their mental illness is the source of the antisocial behavior, that cost of the criminal justice system is far more than if they were provided with appropriate housing and mental health care. Yeah. I mean, if we, if if we made it possible for people to, for severe, with severe mental illness to to get more care, that would be better. But you know, as I say in the book, in the United States, the average time from a first psychosis to first treatment is seventy three weeks. That's a long, you know, year and a half that it takes for somebody to get some kind of care. And if you talk to emergency room doctors, you know, they hate people with mental illnesses because they don't, they feel like they can't do anything with them. And they just want to sort of get them out of the emergency room instead of setting up some kind of care. This is particularly a problematic thing in urban settings and in industrialized societies. In non-industrialized societies, there tend to be more social supports, people living in extended families, joint families, and there people get 
uh, have a better outcome. But it's when we have these, you know, people living in urban areas or being alone or, or homeless that we see worse problems. And this has been borne out by lots and lots of research worldwide. I want to ask you now about ADD and ADHD. You wrote that about 15% of boys and 10% of girls in America have at some point been diagnosed with ADHD. When I was a kid, no one ever heard of these terms. Now it seems like half of all of the families I know have at least one child with ADD or ADHD. How did that happen? One reason that uh, ADHD, first ADD and then now ADHD, really became popularized as a diagnosis was because of a medicine called Ritalin, named after the wife of the inventor of the medicine who was named Margarita and called her Rita for short. And, and Ritalin had been used as a pep pill for elderly patients in nursing homes so that they wouldn't be lying in bed all day and get bed sores and blood clots and so on, and they would have more energy. And just by accident, the pediatrician found that if you gave a tiny, tiny amount of this to kids, they seemed to do better in terms of their behavior. And if you have a medicine that addresses something, then you are going to see that diagnosis blossom. Once you have that diagnosis in place, it kind of feeds back on itself and snowballs so that you get more and more diagnoses. One of the features of the book is that is is my telling of how once you get a new diagnosis it takes off but it only takes off if you've got a whole set of variables that act in concert and so what we have is increased parental advocacy in schools we have a drug ritalin we have a diagnosis add adhd we have epidemiologic studies that didn't exist when you were born about ADHD to show its its prevalence. And we have a big burgeoning special education system. You put all of those things together and then you see things rise like autism or ADHD or whatever it might've been. I mean, autism didn't take off until it became a category in the public school systems in the United States in 1992. So, I mean, it's a really interesting kind of uh, sociological phenomenon. Well, the same thing that I said about ADHD could be said about autism. I I never heard about autism when I was a kid. Now it seems to be very prevalent. Is that because doctors are better at diagnosing it than they used to be? Once we have a framework in place, we start to see it. Hmm. And I'm going to give you an interesting example of this. At Stanford University, some years ago, they made a great effort to address eating disorders, which, as you said, are very life-threatening. And so they thought, well, why not give freshmen women at Stanford a kind of seminar or a course to be on the lookout for eating disorders so they understand it and what the treatments are. And they tested this program by dividing the freshmen women into two halves, random, random separation. And they gave half the students this sort of training and prevention program about eating disorders. And they had them listen to people who had recovered from eating disorders, who'd been successfully treated, and the other didn't get anything. And then they looked at six months, and then at 12 months and 18 months. And they found that the group of women who reported, who had gone through the training sessions about eating disorder prevention, reported far more eating disorder problems than the students who received no training at all. So did the training create eating problems? Did it create the eating disorder? Or did it provide a framework for patterning symptoms that existed before, but they didn't relate to each other? They didn't see them as connected in a pattern. I think it's much more likely to be the latter. And so the answer to your question then is, the more we're attuned to something, the more we see it. I don't mean to give too mundane an example, but let's say you decide you want to buy a car. I don't know. You're going to buy a Volkswagen Golf and you're looking at dealerships. All of a sudden, you're seeing Volkswagen Golfs everywhere on the road. <laughs> you're like, I never knew there were so many Volkswagen Golfs. It happens. 
You wrote that in Iceland, they virtually eradicated Down syndrome because there's a prenatal test for it and any fetus that has it is aborted. And you ask the alarming question whether if there were a prenatal genetic test that could conclusively predict that a child will be autistic, would it be appropriate to abort those fetuses? Isn't this the slippery slope to basically eliminating normal human diversity? It is, and it's, I think, one of the problems with this idea that mental illnesses and human differences can be somehow explained through the genes or, or through, the, through a brain is, is so ethically problematic. Now, you know, take something like autism, okay? There are advocates who say that autism isn't even a disorder. It's not a problem. It's just a different way of being. But yet there are people with autism who suffer tremendously. Maybe they're nonverbal, non-speaking, or they, they have to have, they're self-injurious and, and they need really, you know, intensive lifelong care. We don't want to say that we don't want to treat them or eradicate those symptoms, right? So with mental illnesses, it's probably better these days based on the knowledge that we have to say that these terms, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, autism, are the current frameworks that we have for understanding a set of symptoms. And then rather than thinking that there's this real thing out there called autism, we look at treating people who are suffering in whatever way they're suffering. And if that category of autism works for us, if it's not stigmatizing or dangerous, you know, then by all means we go for that. But it's really about treating functional impairments more than some category that we call schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or whatever. It's, it is different. It is, the mental illnesses are mental illnesses without a known cause. The well, moment I mean, that psychiatry finds a gene or, or some biological explanation for a mental illness, it's taken out of the DSM. This happened with Rett's disorder recently and put in you know, the, the wheelhouse of the neurologist. But psychiatry is really about the, the symptoms, the, the emotional stuff, the behavioral stuff. And you treat the symptoms. Well, Richard, I have only one more question. Do you think we'll ever see the day when a person who's had psychiatric treatment will be elected to a major public office? I hope so. To date, the, the people who have received psychiatric treatment in the American uh, leadership are people who've really um, struggled to get elected and presidents tend to go to ministers to get their mental health care. But there could be problems that ministers can't help with. And I would hope that they could get that care. I should say, we do know that the current Pope had psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So we do have one major leader in the world who's been clear about receiving mental health care. Well, Richard, I must tell you that I've learned so much from your book and from our conversation. Your book is so thought-provoking and Thank compelling and, and refreshing in the way you're challenging us to think about mental illness and differently abled people. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. Oh, I'm honored to have been here. Thank you. Our guest has been anthropologist and author Roy Richard Grinker. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.